Hey everybody, I don't know about you, but as you've watched out over the world, the war in uh, Russia and Ukraine is not just isolated to Eastern Europe. It's spread all over the world and you can see it in market instabilities. You can see it here. People who do not think that that war is affecting you, all you got to do is look at gas prices. You look at uh, your food prices. You see the, the global uh, change that has happened. But you know something that's also affected investments as well. And I've said all along, Legacy Precious Metals is your navigator. They're the ones that see you through to get to the next level. The good news about this is even with market volatility, market instability, you've got uh, options. And gold prices are rising as investors turn to gold. And gold presents a hedge against this inflation and that protects you uh, against the weakening dollar, which we are seeing. Legacy Precious Metals is the only company I trust to deal with gold and silver and the other precious metals. You need this investment. You need this as part of your portfolio to keep you buffered from what we're seeing in the world. War and, and, and volatility in the market. This is where you need to be. Uh, call Legacy Precious Metals today. Uh, be proactive about this. Get on board with it. Call them at 866-528-1900. 0386-528-1903, or you can download their free investor's guide at LegacyPMInvestments.com. LegacyPMInvestments.com, your navigator in a volatile world of investments. Do you want to listen to a podcast? By who? Georgia GOP Congressman Doug Collins. How, how is it? The greatest thing I have ever heard in my whole life. I could not believe my ears. In this house, wherever the rules are disregarded, chaos and mob rule. It has been said today, where is bravery? I'll tell you where bravery is found and courage is found. It's found in this minority who has lived through the last year of nothing but rules being broken, people being put down, questions not being answered, and this majority say, be damned with anything else. We're going to impeach and do whatever we want to do. Why? Because we won an election. I guarantee you, one day you'll be back in the minority and it ain't going to be that fun. Hey everybody, good morning. It is an early morning here uh, on this uh, podcast day here on the Doug Collins Podcast. Glad that you are uh, with us. We're, we're excited to take this day just to do some hot takes. I, I'm not going to go into in-depth uh, on some of the uh, election results because, frankly, we, we just don't have some of the numbers to go in-depth with. It, it's it's going to be interesting, though, and I tell you, from what we've been talking about, as you heard on the podcast last week, uh, some of the things just did not uh, – appear some did i mean i think if you look at it, let's just go over what did seem to to pan out as we thought it would except for pennsylvania which we always thought was a uh again was a possibility uh that was a difficult race between fetterman and oz it, it does appear fetterman has won that race so out of the five that we had to hold uh we lost one we lost pennsylvania which means as you know from the podcast that we've always talked about that you have to uh, now pick up two for Republicans to take control. Uh, right now, I'm looking for uh, the one because right now we, we've not seen that. Now, Arizona uh, is, is still very uh, much coming in. These numbers are, are tightening up out there. Arizona, uh, just like in the last election in 2020, will be one in which we're going to have to wait uh, several days for. Uh, but Masters is running significantly behind uh, Kelly in that race, and Lake is running better than Masters. So, um, yeah, again, they're both down. Uh, Kerry Lake and Blake Masters are both down to the Democrats, Hobbs and, and uh, Kelly. But the numbers have been coming in overnight uh, a lot more uh, Republican than they were in the early votes, which were decidedly Democrat. Uh let me just stop right here for just a second. Before we get into any further, that is one of the hot take takeaways that we have seen. The elections now have transformed into Democrats voting early and Republicans voting on election day. Um, it, that has become you know, not only more of a trend we saw even in, in 2020, uh, 2018. Early on, this would have not been true. Early on, what what election, uh, you know, early voting would have had, typically uh, Republicans uh, had uh, some early votes, uh, so did Democrats, but it was it was not as pronounced as we're seeing now. Uh, I'll give you an example of Arizona. We just saw that most of all of the early votes that came in were decidedly Democrat. You, Georgia, again, this was one, and, and we'll talk about uh, more in depth here in just a minute, but Georgia, the early voting was, dis, I mean, more than just decidedly Democrat. It was overwhelmingly uh, Democrat. But yet when the day of voting came in, early day of it, these uh, went overwhelmingly Republican. And you, you have Brian Kemp, who won easily over Stacey Abrams, 
uh, and down the ticket where they were you know, in the first 45 minutes or an hour of reporting when these early ballots were being counted. Uh, Kemp, uh, everybody on the ticket was down. All that flipped the day, on day of voting. So what is it's really interesting now from a perspective of a Republican and a Democrat, you, the Democrats now depend on early voting. They're, they're using the mail, the, the early voting by mail, or they're using early voting uh, to get their uh, votes out. Republicans are now depending on day of voting, which is going to be interesting over time because it's always been one of those things. If you have issues on day of, if you had, you know, last minute things come up, depending on the day of voting is, is typically, you know, has a little more uh, fraught to it, especially if you're in a, a state like Georgia and others who have a very generous early voting uh, time frame. Uh, going, uh, you know, backwards of three weeks where you can actually in-person early vote during the week and on weekends. So, uh, again, this is just changing the dynamics. So that's just a quick hot take that, that came out of, of what we're looking in uh, these elections. Uh, real quickly, let's go through it, though. Uh, Ron Johnson is looking like he will take uh, Wisconsin, although that is, again, still closer than than. I think many of us predicted or thought you got uh, J.D. Vance easily winning Ohio, uh, Ted Budd easily winning uh, North Carolina, Fetterman uh, uh, beating Oz, if, if, if these numbers right now hold, uh, Fetterman has beat Oz in Pennsylvania. We have held uh, Missouri with uh, Schultz out there. So that's, uh, you know, Missouri held, uh, Ohio held, looks like Wisconsin will hold, uh, the North Carolina held. Uh, that, again, now puts us in some interesting seats. Now, I will say early on, um, Alaska, and, and this is very early. I mean, and again, we're here in the morning of the day after the election on a Wednesday morning uh, going at this. And, but it does appear that Murkowski in Alaska could be uh, at least early vote uh, numbers are turning out. Trubisky up there is is giving Murkowski a run for her money in Alaska. Now, uh, that is still a Republican. A Republican wouldn't change the dynamic of the Republican Senate, but it is something uh, interesting to watch, uh, given the fact that the Democrat in the congressional race is winning handily over Sarah Palin and others at this point in, in the early uh, returns from Alaska as we go forward. Um, I, I've been asked all morning and late into last night as I was doing uh, the commentary on networks from, you know, both Fox News, Max, and others, you know, what does this mean? Where does it go? Uh, let's just try and sum up uh, where we are. What was uh, very interesting, very good last night, if you were coming from a conservative state, number one was Florida. Ron DeSantis uh, took a seat in which he won by really 0.1, in four years ago and won by 20 points last night. I mean, it was a complete beatdown uh, in the state of Florida. Now, uh, Charlie Chris was an awful candidate, um, sh you know, should have never won. But then again, nobody wanted to run against Ron DeSantis in Florida because Ron had built up a uh, not only a very uh, high profile uh, governorship with keeping the state open, working to keep businesses going. But he also uh, d and there's a beyond the gap there of governance that Ron DeSantis and his administration did very well. And that was he did the administrative part well. I mean, the businesses were, were kept informed, the schools were kept running, the money was going out, the train, so to speak, ran on time. Uh, when the hurricane hit, uh, it was, I mean, you don't hear anything out of Ian. And Ian was one of the most devastating hurricanes to hit South Florida on that side, on the western side that's, that's been in, in years. And yet, I mean, you know, the, the bridges are being put back together. People's homes are getting uh, put back together. They, they've reduced the regulatory burden. And, and, and again, the mainstream media has left Florida. This is, I mean, if this had, uh, if they had not been doing so well, Florida would be inundated with national press talking about how bad DeSantis did. And he didn't. He did a great job uh, working that out. Again, now everybody is, is saying this is a, uh, you know, now an early referendum on 2024, especially with Donald Trump saying he's going to announce uh, for president next week. Uh, again, I think it makes an interesting case to see what happens uh, as we go forward here. Will DeSantis take that uh, opportunity to run against uh, Donald Trump? Will others jump into the race? Uh, a lot of the conversation is, is that will be true. I, I, again, my hot take at this second is uh, just I say just hold on. I, I, I'm not sure DeSantis is wanting to use his political capital, although it is immense at this point, uh, to run against uh, the former president. The former president had a lot of, um, you know, elections picked uh, candidates in certain special the governor's races that did not come through last night. Um, but for this, for president Trump, that is not a concern on his. He always keeps looking forward. He never looks back. So again, I think too early to tell, but Florida, definitely a bright spot 
uh, Miami-Dade County. I mean, just the, the demographic breakdown that, that DeSantis and the others on the ticket were able to bring, uh, pretty amazing. Uh, Georgia. Georgia, again, uh, Brian Kemp did away with Stacey Abrams, no problems. Uh, higher than, than most had expected. Uh, Abrams had basically, as, as we've talked about here on the podcast, board sort of basically had started phoning it in, had quit, uh, and the, the end result showed it. Um, where that actually is different, though, is in the Senate race. And this is where I'm going to go back to probably the biggest issue that we've talked about on this podcast uh, many times, and that is that the fundamentals matter. Fundamentals matter when it comes to race. Candidates matter, and how candidates run matters. Uh, Walker uh, is an example here. Warnock is an example here. Both of them are flawed candidates in the sense that the public – uh, in polling, didn't trust them. Their their fave unfave numbers were upside down. Um, yeah, and it does appear though that Walker had a little bit more of a tug on that uh, issue, both going down because you could see the breakdown that that Kemp out uh, performed Walker significantly, almost four points uh, or more in this uh, election cycle. Uh, you know with upwards of almost 100,000, 200,000 votes, depending on where we're at right now. Um, what does that mean? It means that people did not want to vote. They wanted to vote for Brian Kemp, maybe because of how he handled uh, the past four years as governor, the elections, the pandemic, everything else. And for whatever reason, the same Republicans could not vote for or did not vote for uh, Herschel Walker. I saw a lot of, of signs yesterday that says that people were going to be voting for uh, Brian Kemp and others on the Republican ticket, but they simply left the uh Seeing it race off. So, again, we'll see what happens right now. Right now, currently, as we speak here early on a, a Wednesday morning, the uh, Republican and Democrat in Georgia look to be headed to a runoff, although there is room uh, right now because Warnock is actually ahead by about 30,000 votes. There is some room that if the numbers broke very, very well for Warnock, uh, he could win without a runoff. That would be, a, a, I think, a, an amazing story, devastating for uh, Senate hopefuls in Georgia, uh, but uh, you know it is still there. That means that this race is going to a runoff December 6th. Uh, we'll see. That's four weeks of just flat out spending and money. And, and again, if you look at what we've been talking about here on this podcast for a while, this is also the possibility that we could see uh, Georgia become the epicenter for the uh, battle for the Senate. Uh, with the five holding, except for Pennsylvania, means we needed to pick up two. Right now, the only places to pick those up, New Hampshire was a loss, Washington State was a loss. Again, very much uh, stretches that never materialized. Nevada, Laxalt is up as we speak. We'll see if that uh, holds. If that's true, then there is your even. So we pick up one, we lose one. Uh, Arizona, we talked about a few minutes ago, still uh, yet to be determined. And then Georgia. So, again, if you picked up, if we ran a clean sweep, which, you know, again, given the results of last night, uh, is unlikely. But let's just say we do pick up Masters and, and Lake do make a, a, a large comeback in Arizona from these early vote numbers into the day of voting, and they win. Then that gives us two to one, which means that the Republicans are uh, uh, back in control of getting the Senate, but yet you still have Georgia out. Um, and, you know, if they hold there, then we're we're in the good position. But again, you got to, the Republicans have the harder run now. They've got to make the, the run, at which looks at uh, more and more like it coming back down to Georgia. So we'll see uh, how that flows. Uh, governor's races uh, uh, across the uh, states, uh, Michigan. Michigan was one, you know, from a, a, an interesting perspective, you know, the governor candidates mattered and uh, in Mastriano and Pennsylvania just never, uh, never seemed to campaign, never got going and lost badly. And there's going to be many people who are going to uh, say that, the, you know, they're just the absolute uh, fallout disaster, however you want to put it, for the Mastriano campaign affected the Oz campaign. Um, that'll be debated uh, ad nauseum here for the next uh, little bit. But, but Mastriano was never a factor um, that hurt uh, I think a lot of Republican issues in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, go to Tudor Dixon, who I think was a good candidate, just got, uh, again, got overwhelmed by an incumbent, uh, Gretchen uh, Whitmer up there, who just, uh, again, I don't understand. I'm going to be just blunt with you. I don't understand Michigan. 
Michigan's a wonderful state. I got a lot of good friends up in Michigan. But yet, in the same election cycle, you reelect the governor who shut everything down, was a hypocrite on so many of those issues. And also, you give the uh, state, House, and Senate to the uh, Democrats. I, I don't get that. I mean, for, for all the people who, I mean, who with schools were closed, people were closed. I mean, this was just a, a, a disaster for the last few years from the pandemic. And yet now Democrats have full control the first time they have the trifecta up there in a long time. Uh, again, you respect the voters at the end of the day, but that one was one, frankly, I just uh, didn't understand. Um, New York, uh, Lee Zeldin's not going to win in New York. There was a hope, didn't happen. But on the congressional side of that, uh, we pick up a, a good many seats, four to five seats in New York in the House. In fact, right now, if you uh, with uh, the Republicans taking control of the U.S. House, which it does appear they will do um, after some slip ups, won't we'll be near the numbers that we've talked about. 225, I had already said 225 to 235 uh, was the number and 225 being a bad night well right now 225 would actually look pretty good uh considering the numbers that are coming in it does mean that uh the republicans will control the speakership will control the agenda now we'll just have to see uh you know really how does that affect kevin mccarthy i mean mccarthy was upwards of 60 seats all the the euphoria of 240 230 seats it means that there's some bad polling it means that there was some bad information out there there was some exuberance that uh, should have not been taken into account. You know, does that affect McCarthy, who uh, in his speaker run? Now, it is also uh, you know worth noting, though McCarthy has been the driving force for getting the the House back. They won 14 seats in the 2020 election when nobody thought they would. Now they're going to take back the House. Uh, I think McCarthy rightfully deserves a great deal of credit for that. But when it doesn't go as the expect doesn't meet the expectation game, that is a uh, problem. Uh, for McCarthy, uh, there's already rumors the lease may uh, mount a, a leadership challenge for the speakership. It could throw out some of these other races down the uh, leadership ticket uh, going forward. So, again, who knows at this point how that's going to fall out over the next 24 to 48 hours uh, by Friday's podcast. I'll ask maybe some more word for you on that. We'll see what uh, this comes. It also signals a very much a gridlock in Congress. Um, the House will be Republican controlled, but the House will not be. Uh, and I've said this, I can't tell you how many times that you've heard it here on the podcast and I've said it on the interviews. The, the House is a pure majority body. It is up to the Republicans to pass bills. If they cannot get 218 Republicans, they will simply fail as a majority. And that is uh, something they have to face. So for, for, for people who've never voted yes on appropriations bill, people who've never voted yes on other bills, you know, if they continue to vote no, then Republicans cannot pass legislation unless they have Democrat support, which means that you're not going to get the most conservative bills, which means you're not going to get you know, a lot of the priorities that conservatives want especially if people hold out. And then if you go too far to pick up his other votes, you could lose Republicans and you'll definitely lose all Democrats. Again, putting it squarely back on the majority. That's what Kevin McCarthy and the leadership team in the House face, given the, run, the turnout and the results from last night. Uh, governing matters, folks. Um, and again, Pelosi did a amazing job keeping a very slim majority, three or four vote majority intact and passing what she did. The question now becomes, could uh, Kevin McCarthy and the Republicans do the same thing? We'll see. I mean, it's going to be tough because, I mean, you've got a lot of votes on the House side uh, that, you know, just, you know, frankly, from history will tell you that this is going to be a very tough cycle to get anything passed in the House. Uh, and then with the Senate possibly being still in Democratic hands, at this moment, that's a concern. Uh, I'm going to do a late, I'm going to do a much better, bigger breakdown on the Georgia runoff, if that's where it actually heads, the Georgia runoff between Warnock and, and uh, uh, Walker later. Right now, it's just you know too early to, to do that breakdown. I want to take some time to look at some numbers, see where Walker or Warnock's path is, to see the national climate. Is Georgia going to be the battle for control of the Senate? Um, you know, if it is, then this race could be, uh, th that will affect how it, uh, I think, will turn out for both uh, Walker and for Warnock. So we'll, th we'll discuss those as well. Um, but just to, at the end of the day, it, it is, it, it goes back to something that we've talked about here and I've had guests on before, and I'm just going to simply leave it at this this morning. And that is candidates matter. Fundamentals matter for all of you out there who 
you know, get hung up on who endorsed who. And even though they're great endorsements and President Trump had a good run of endorsements and, you know, Democrats say they had a good run of endorsements. At the end of the day, it's about candidates. It's about candidates and, and, and matter. And if you get the endorsement of Donald Trump and you're like Mastriano in Pennsylvania and you do absolutely nothing with it, then you're going to lose. And that's exactly what happened there. Uh, if, you, if you don't run very good campaigns or don't have the money in, in a place like New Hampshire where Maggie Hansen should have gotten beat, General Bullock, I mean, it seems may have done the best he could, but it just didn't work. And it doesn't matter who the uh, endorsing person is. If you don't have uh, the oomph behind you, if you don't have the campaign team, if you don't have the structure, folks, get over this thought that just everybody is, uh, you know, on the same page as you are and that they'll just see the obvious that you think is obvious. That's just not true. So, uh, again, number one, candidates matter. Fundamentals matter. We saw that in the primaries in Georgia. We saw it in a couple other states. Uh, this is still the, the trend. That's what we saw. I think that's the biggest takeaway that I can take of early on this Wednesday morning is fundamentals matter, and we've got to uh, ensure the candidates understand that. Number two, governing is going to be hard for the Republicans in the House. They're going to take the majority, but governing, which is what you're mainly sent to Washington, D.C. to do, is going to be very difficult. The next few days is going to determine a lot on what leadership lesson, uh, later, leadership elections look like and how the uh, – House will function. Senate still up in the air. We'll talk more about that as we go forward. But right now, um, the voters gave us a glorious uh, mess, if you would, in many ways, a very mixed picture across the country. Uh, if Biden says he has a, uh, a mandate here, that's just a lie. Uh, although he did, then the Biden team did something that normally doesn't happen, and that is they defied the odds of a midterm. Uh, first midterm. And and nobody, again, was banking on that. Historically, the House majority would lose 27 seats. They're not going to come anywhere close to that uh, in this uh, election, barring, you know, some certain changes. So there is some solace in the Biden administration they can take in that. Uh, if they were able to keep the Senate, that's a huge victory uh, as you look forward to it. But yet in places like Georgia and Florida and, and other places, uh, Republicans just steamroll. Uh, Ohio, I mean, it's becoming non, you know, purple. It's, it's a red. So these are all the kind of things that you need to look at as we go. Wanted to give you a, a quick taste of uh, where we're at here on this morning. These are the hot takes uh, as we go. Before I go, though, you've got to uh, go to the DougCollinsPodcast.com forward slash DC. We've got a trip coming up in April. I uh, want you to be a part. Go there. You can get uh, the benefits of uh, – uh, money off for the trip. We're going to tour uh, the monuments. We're going to go to the Capitol. We're going to go to the, the uh, Museum of the Bible. We're going to go with Eric, the travel guy. We're going to have a great time uh, up there. Lisa and I would love to have you reserve your spot on the bus trip to D.C. in April. Make sure that you get in. Go to the DougCollinsPodcast.com forward slash D.C. to get all the details and to sign up uh, for the trip. We'd love to have you be a part of that uh, as we move forward. Uh, looking forward to that trip as we go. But for now, signing off. Uh, on this podcast, go out and have a great day. Look forward to talking to you again soon as we do more of diving into what this uh, 2020 election, two election cycle means and what it doesn't mean. God bless you. Take care. Hey, everybody. My pillow. I just wanted to let you know, my pillow is having the biggest sheet sale of the year. You'll have to help. Uh, you have all have helped build my pillow into an amazing company that it is today. And now Mike Lindell, the inventor and CEO, wants to give back exclusively to his listeners. Uh, the Percal bed sheet is set is available in a variety of colors and sizes, and they're all on sale. For example, the queen size is regularly priced at $89.98, but it is now only $39.98 with our listener promo code. Order now because they, when they're gone, they're gone. You're not going to be able to get it. These Percal sheets are breathable. They have cool, crisp feel. They, feel, they come with a 10-year warranty, 60-day money-back guarantee. Don't miss out on this incredible offer. There's a limited supply, so be sure to order now. Call one 800 986-3994. Use the promo code Collins, C-O-L-L-I-N-S, or you can go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio listener square and use the promo code Collins, C-O-L-L-I-N-S. Lisa and I sleep on these sheets every night. You will want to have them as well. They're a wonderful product. Go right now, either 800-986-3994, code word Collins, or go to MyPillow.com. Also use the code word Collins to get this discount. You will not regret it.